Good evening, and welcome to the Hero's Breath Podcast. I am your ever verbose host, Matthew Huddle. And joining Matt is verbose Tom. It's not so verbose. The recording date is Tuesday, January 29th, 2019. This is episode 13. We are going to be talking about refusal of the return. This is brought to you by Apply Center. That's Primary Holistic Integrative Center, where we do all that we can to make you guys the best versions of yourselves that you can be with acupuncture, physical therapy, herbology, neurofeedback. A lot of the uh, biohacking community uh, is familiar with, uses. Matt, you've had some experience with it. Fantastic experiences, honestly. Uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD, OCD, and dysthymia, which is a form of depression, when I was 20. And the dysthymia is gone. I mean, all the way gone. I can't get depressed anymore. More importantly, it's getting all the parts of my brain, the different selves, the unconscious, subconscious, conscious minds, and all their many fractal varieties all together, all talking. And it's just helping me process decades of issues and traumas, all the things that we don't necessarily know are there. If you're willing to put in the work on yourself, which if you're listening to this podcast, I'm hoping that's somewhat in your interest, then the mind program is honestly, it's it's the magic elixir for me. It's the supernatural aid. It's really been getting me further on my journey than I ever thought possible. And so if you guys want to learn more about the mind program, some of the other services that are offered at the Five Center, check us out at fivecenter.nyc. Additionally, we want to give a huge shout out to our good friend James Moreno, the, our editor in Beard. He is the one responsible for cleaning up the audio so that we sound so good, but he's not just all about audio. He does video, he does great photography. So you wanna go check him out at jamesmorano.com. If you like what you've been hearing and you guys wanna support us and allow us to continue to support you on your journey, we're not gonna ask for money. Well, we're not gonna say no to it either. For a lot of obvious reasons, we can't yet set up a Patreon account. We know that money can be tight. We do offer a solution. We've said before, if you go to the YouTube channel, and you go down to the description in the podcast highlights playlist all these videos are here in the description are going to be links to Amazon to get any of the books or movies or shows that we've mentioned that's also on the blog itself at the bottom of each blog those same links are there if you click on those links if you buy the stuff we recommend through Amazon through those links we get a little percentage and guys it's not costing you anything more to do that and of course we say we but it's not Tom and I, it's hero's breath. So the money does not go into our pockets. It goes back into providing more value for you all. It goes towards equipment. It goes to, you know, office supplies, like whatever we need, miscellaneous expenses for this podcast. We don't recommend stuff just to recommend it just for entertainment value. Obviously, we found a lot of value in these books and movies, and we try to share that with you, so that's why we make those recommendations. So if you get value out of this podcast, you wanna help us out, you wanna hear more great content, use the links in the YouTube description for each video, use the links at the bottom of the blog. Everybody wins, really. Everyone wins. So the refusal of the return. Now, you remember, of course, call to adventure refusal of the call, even though they're considered separate stages to kind of have sandwich those two together. In this case, the refusal of the turn can really be its own stage. While I was researching for this, I realized there's so much more depth here that you don't really think about. It's not always used in the story, though. Let me start with that. And this is the part where the hero hesitates to cross their turn threshold back to his ordinary world. He's been to the special world. In many cases, the hero can become corrupted or just simply tempted because he can find so much meaning in this new special world mm -hmm. for one reason or another. Sometimes too, he's just simply too exhausted to return. And he's just like, well, you know, I've achieved the ultimate boon. I've done the thing, fuck it. Once the heroes reap the, the fruits of the struggles, this refusal can sometimes manifest. Two really good examples in recent cinema history, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, and The Hurt Locker, and for, for different reasons. Now, when Tolkien set the scene up where Frodo has to cast the ring into the fires of Mount Doom, right as he's about to do it, the sickening influence that has been weakening him and corrupting him and plaguing him this whole time, carrying this massive burden in this little ring, finally overtakes him. It's like, it's my precious, and he puts it on his finger, and of course, Gollum, who had been trailing Frodo and Sam, jumps out and bites the ring off, and they fight, and Gollum in the ring and Frodo's finger go off over the edge and into the lava. You could see, like, Frodo's suddenly like come out of the the spell now and he's like okay i came really close to just fucking all this up he's hanging on to the edge of the cliff like he fell over with golem golem went in he's hanging on but his conscience and best friend sam comes by and is imploring him not to give up it's sam's love and faith in him frodo thinks all right let me just 
try to at least see this through. So he reaches up for Sam's hand and Sam pulls him up. They try to make their way home. Now in contrast, in the Hurt Locker, Staff Sergeant William James is a bomb disposal expert. He never went home. Towards the end of the film, he went home in body. He went back to be with his wife and his little baby boy, but he never returned in his mind in his soul, in his heart. It was still in Iraq. This was really interesting, I, I thought, because it was the thrill of defusing bombs in enemy territory under heavy fire. It gave him such a strong sense of purpose, and we had talked about this in the overview. Soldiers can sometimes have a problem returning because they have such camaraderie and purpose, and then you come back to this flat, boring life where your biggest decision is which Pop-Tarts to buy. But he couldn't stomach a quiet domestic life anymore. And now he was a gifted officer. He was like the best of them all, and he could do what nobody else could do, and he saved so many lives. And But his heroism was shallow because his personal development as a hero had never become complete. He never grew. He was always allowing his inner dragon to compel him back to the battlefield so he could feel fulfilled while risking his life. What does it matter if he's really good at it? Eventually, he's going to hit, get that bomb that he just can't defuse, or some sniper's gonna take him out. Eventually, his skills, his gift, will die with him. Now if on the other hand, let's say he returned to the US and integrated his shadow self throughout this journey, his own personal journey, he could have maybe become an instructor and taught other people to do the same things he could do, maybe not as well, but if he was like, you know, skill level 100, if he taught, let's say, another 100 people how to be skill level 80 instead of skill level 50, more lives could have been saved than he ever could have. He could have perpetuated a cycle, a new hero cycle, but he didn't. He became a thrill-seeking villain at the end of that story, really. Given that, maybe he wasn't done. I feel like this hero's journey is never ever over until you're dead. To some extent, that refusal, in the same way that, you know, the call to action, is always going to be there. This refusal, it'll always still be there. This character, like you and I, like whoever's listening, we're constantly going to be re-immersing ourselves mm -hmm. into that cycle mm -hmm. until maybe finally that lesson clicks and we realize, oh wait, now we need to go back that integration of the shadow self, right? It's the integration of these different components mm -hmm. of the individual, and it's the integration of that person's trials and experiences, transformations. It's placing the ego aside. Mm -hmm. In both of these situations, mm -hmm. it was the ego that prevented, or nearly prevented, mm -hmm. both. it's always about the greater good. That's what it always comes down to, yeah. right? Like, you return to the tribe because now you're a whole member of the tribe that's not in it for himself, but mm -hmm. in it for the whole. You work on yourself so yeah. that way you can show up 110% in life. The hero becomes the symbol of what can be achieved by mere mortal man. Sergeant James never, at least as far as we know, as far as the as movie as is the concerned. concerned right. So we consider that the end of that story arc unless they created a sequel right. for it. This stage is really, really runs home for me. When I was first learning Campbell's work and I realized how it mapped to, the lie, to our lives, I was concerned about this one the most because for me, when I left my family's faith, that was the world I left. So to make a return trip home, it would be impossible because it's an unalterable place. I was a heretic. I left the fold, I left the faith. And short of coming down from a mountain with tablets under my arm and a glowing face, I wasn't changing anybody. So I'm like, all right, fuck, is this gonna be like the end of my journey? Right. Like, am I gonna get stuck to no fault of my own? Gary Vee and Ty Lopez and all those personal development guys say this all the time. It's like, don't worry about the end of your journey. Don't just think about, like, you know, it's great to have a vision board with mansions and cars and shit on it, but don't necessarily worry about where it's going to go. Focus on each step. Like Henry Ford said, don't look at the whole staircase, look at each step. So that's exactly what I did. And I just got into this development shtick and I just said, all right, fuck it, I'll emulate that bridge when I have to. Eventually, what I discovered throughout the course of writing this blog and working on this podcast is that it was only the first of really two thresholds leaving the same enclosure. I'm talking about collectivism, not just in terms of a, the political ideology, but as a social norm. Everybody gets divided into groups through different metrics, you know, your age, your race, your gender, your religion, and all this other stuff. I realized later as I moved out of it, it was socioeconomic status that was really underneath all of it. Most marriages, mine include, break up because of money issues. It's gonna sound so aggravating to so many people because it used to aggravate me when people would say it. Your level of wealth is really a state of mind. You say, oh no, look at my wallet, it's empty, there's moths in it. Whatever your money is, how you feel about it, how you feel about yourself, all these factors come into play. I didn't understand all that way back. And then I went through this journey where I eventually did. Throughout the autumn of 2018, I was going through this feeling, this unspoken, almost imperceptible feeling of something just 
bad. It was just like malaise and anxiety. It wasn't depression, because that's gone. <laughs> and as I've bitched about before, without my depression, I don't necessarily know what I'm getting off track anymore in, in terms of my, my personal life and growth and journey. And I figured this feeling has to be like all that's left. Like the, the empty vacancy where depression used to be. So I started asking myself, why is this happening? What if I screwed up or what am I not doing? Eventually, it was external forces that acted on my unconscious mind's behalf. And then I realized that I was stuck in the refusal of the return stage. But I feel like if I talk too long, people wonder if you walked out of the room. <laughs> what was this? All right. So like, how did that manifest for you? Let me talk about how I figured it out. Okay. It was Thanksgiving. I was at my ex-wife's house and a little family drama ended up being the catalyst to issues being talked about. Between different, different people, no, I'm not gonna get into specifics. It was jarring at first, but it ended up, I would say, having a net positive effect. Towards the end of the night, Lauren and I finally had a chance to talk about some things that had been left under the surface between us, specifically socio-political matters mm -hmm. that were important to her. She wanted to know where I stood on these things. She brought it up, I didn't, I'm very proud of myself. I'm even more <laughs> proud of myself because I kept the conversation on track. I kept the answers to just what she asked. I didn't talk about nuance, and neither one of us was really trying to win. I think I really just wanted to talk because I felt like there was something that needed to be talked about. We had some moderate debate and we went back and forth a little bit, but we weren't trying to change anyone's mind. But more than anything else, the impact left on me was that I was woken up out of this trance because like I said, when I left the realm of my family's faith and then I was still a little socialist shithead, and then eventually I realized that I had got myself in this bad position because of my anger and blame sharing. At that time, I left a whole bunch of other people who never thought I was wrong to blame the 1% for all my problems. We believe that we are all components of a group and there's the have group and the have not group. All we would do is rail against the haves. Looking back, I think unconsciously we all knew we could better use our off time instead of just playing video games and getting drunk and, and just, or just hanging out and not doing anything. Maybe we could have been taking education courses, learning about business, doing Podcast. Listening to podcasts, <laughs> hint, hint. We could have been doing more, and I think at some point we we really did understand that, but we didn't want to face that. And I say we, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but you're the sum of the people you surround yourself with. My tribe, we didn't really know that the value was not in the having, because there's like this huge gap between you, where you are at that point, playing video games, sitting on the couch eating Cheetos, and like Gary Vee and Ty Lopez. And you think about getting there, so, well, it's such a big gulf. Well, fuck it, who cares? I'm not even gonna try. But then I didn't know it's a process. It's a process of working towards developing yourself. The rewards are in the pain. And I had to learn that the hard way. None of us knew this. So getting myself out of this collectivist realm began with an honest self-examination followed by the acquisition of proper knowledge, the shifting my perspective based on that understanding, and then once that knowledge was all settled into myself, I just had to walk that new path. The demons vanished before me, I got myself out of Naraka, I went into the special world for this information. I left the world of distractions and blame sharing to reality. And the narcissistic dragon in me had very little power. I had to just deal with the tangible effects of reality, not the things I wanted, not the things that should have been. That's where I found my treasure. And my treasure wasn't what I thought it would be. It was stoicism, rugged individualism, meritocracy. These were the fairy tales of the 1%. You know, work hard and you'll get there. I used to think that was a myth of a fucking fairy dragon. Turns <laughs> out the dragon, all of it was real. That's what the treasure was. But I used it to gain relative mastery over that shadow self. I say relative because it's an ongoing journey for all of us. And then I allowed my true potential to become tangibly manifest in terms of my behaviors and my actions. And I'm not yet largely successful, but I'm working towards it. I'm happy because I've learned to enjoy the process of self-improvement. And I want to share this with the people who are in my ordinary world. My friends, some of them you know, are still kind of just muddling through and I want yeah. more for them, but I can't make them do it. But how do I convey this message? I couldn't so, have done it the way I was doing it. At the end of the day, you model it, live it. Mm -hmm. And people are drawn to that. They're drawn to the fact that, okay, I'm watching my friend or so-and-so. Like the people that we aspire to, the people that we look up to, the reason we do is because we see someone who, just like ourselves, was born, mm -hmm. went through life, mm -hmm. grew, faced some kind of adversity. There's wow, so man. many things that happen to people. Out of those situations, you have people like Oprah come down. Most of the time, it's the pain that directs us towards where there's an imbalance. 
it directs us towards where there's room for improvement. Right? Yeah, but it's first we us, run away from the pain. And that's natural. That's normal. And no one should feel bad about that. But at the end of the day, like what you were describing with your own story, and I commend you for this, is it's, it's developing that level of awareness. Who takes the time to really stop and think and assess? To kind of see, okay, what myths have I been told? Where do I now need to start making the shift? But it's developing self-awareness like... It's a timeless truth. Know thyself. Know your own triggers. Know your own habits. Know your own traumas and wounds. And do some self-work to really unpack all of that. To see why you are where you are right now. What may be preventing you from moving forward. Because you were then motivated to seek in that special world the, the knowledge that you, that you needed. In doing so, there was a lot of trials along the way for you and a lot of pain. All of it was transformative. And I say this to all of you, like whatever path you're on is the right path. We get so caught up because there's so many different, maybe I need to be Catholic, maybe I need to be Buddhist, maybe I need to go this way or that way or this way or that way. No, your path is your path. That's where your growth is gonna come from. That's where your transformation is gonna come from. That's what's gonna motivate you to move forward. And those are the tools, that raw material that you have to work with. It always comes down to one thing and that's choice and you made the choice to improve yourself maybe you were inspired by those you were looking up to that inspiration might ultimately go towards your friends you become their inspiration i mean i don't want to get these lofty ideals but as i was talking with lauren i realized that i had let my baser instincts take over the last couple of years in particular but the last few years it's it's been less apparent versus now in the last two years more apparent that our society is incredibly divided. The values of hard work and personal responsibility seem to have become ensconced in one socio-political camp and the other side has laid claim to compassion and understanding but that's just a perception. The reality is no political faction can claim responsibility or, or claim a monopoly on the things that have gotten man from the savannah to the stars. Both of those live inside of us and there's potential for both and they're not mutually exclusive in any shape or form. Right. We're all called upon to become responsible members of society. It's the internal work so that way you come back you don't re refuse to call to come back to the ordinary world because you found that maturization where you want to be a contributor a provider my protector uh you want to be that member uh for your tribe with that also does come compassion it these is... all go hand in hand our society has cut things up and we say oh this group is does things like this and this group things like that and, and you know as dr peterson has brought out psychologically speaking you have certain traits that'll lean you towards conservatism or liberalism or whatever but you can't necessarily either blame the other side for all of society's problems we're all in this bullshit together and what i neglected to keep in mind is that according to jungian philosophy i'm a warrior archetype i have fierce loyalty to my tribe and a simple polarized worldview. Friend is friend, foe is foe. You deal with them accordingly. What's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. Like these kinds of things, humans like simple answers. Mm -hmm. While I may be a complicated individual, my brain goes in all sorts of directions. Underneath it all, this operating code is fairly simplistic. So once I became accustomed, once I left my ordinary world, I got accustomed to the special world. I learned all these new things, the lies I've been told, you know, saw through all this stuff, I made new allies, and these people, they taught me so much, and now I'm identifying with them more and more, and only them. And so as the culture war raged on, my penchant for combat compelled me to move more and more towards one side and further away from my destiny. Because as we'll talk about more, it's the job of the hero to walk between two worlds, but I wasn't completing the cycle. Mm -hmm. I got the elixir, I achieved the ultimate boon, well, I have to bring it back to my old tribe. I wasn't doing that. I was comfortable in battle. I was more comfortable fighting half my country than trying to take the lessons I applied and, and move forward with them. By the end of the story, the hero has to integrate his dark side, walk between the two worlds, and like Sergeant James, who never overcame his personal limitations, I was feeling that fight for right. And yeah. it's a wonderful distraction. See, it's, that's the thing. It was a new distraction for me. Instead of video games, I was living a video game, right. fighting everybody, but every time I try to red pill the other side or bolster up my side on social media. All I was doing is putting more bricks in the wall. It's so much easier to try to <clears throat> wrestle with the problems versus trying to sit and integrate them. Sit with them, be with them, and allow them to transform you. And to be fair for you, don't do that. <laughs> of a warrior type, you are also very highly motivated and driven. And so like you have that energy behind you constantly. Right. And so that needs an outlet. You know, that's a good point I didn't really think about because I'm not very nice to myself. No, uh, and, but, but everyone <laughs> listening in, that just these past few weeks was having a real hard time no. not doing something. 
You know? Not doing anything. Things are kind of stalled. We'll talk about in a few weeks. That's sometimes where your biggest growth is going to be coming from because it's the thing that you're resisting the most. It's the silence, the mm -hmm. stagnation, right? The not fighting. And so for some, they might need to actually be fighting because maybe they've been too comfortable not engaging, right? Others right. are just constantly go, go, go. Right. We have to move ourselves into uncomfortability. Yes. As I've said before, I'm, I'm a conservative. I'm really more of like a center right, but whatever. Once I really discovered that about myself, it was like so many things started clicking and making more sense. It's not like anyone said, hey, you know, you should come on over here and here, put this red hat on. It wasn't like that. It was more like started hanging out with different people and went, oh, everything that this group believes really resonates more with me. I have heightened levels of conscientiousness and all these things Dr. Peterson talks about. So I slid into that, but yeah, I got into the trenches but I was making it harder to return because I was, and, and honestly, I've lost friends while I would say they blocked me. I was making it easy to block me because it was just go toe to toe. It wasn't yeah. looking for that middle ground. It wasn't looking for a conversation. It was looking to have a fight. And I was very, very guilty of that. And Lauren made me understand that she was my conscience, my best friend. She reached out her hand to me and I took it. Now like Frodo took Sam's hand in that case. And that night she reminded me about what makes Captain America such a good role model. Why I was always so drawn to him. Now, Dr. Peterson refers to Christ in his lectures a lot because, as he says, you know, Christ is a psychological ideal. He says an ideal is not only compassion, it's the ideal is a judge because you don't live up to it. And so your ideal is always looking at you like you're not what you're supposed to be. Captain America is my ideal, not because of his suite of abilities, but because of who he is. And much the same way that the Venom black suit amplified Peter Parker's worst traits, turning him into a villain, really, in, in Spider-Man 3, the serum that turned Steve Rogers from a sickly boy to a super soldier it amplified his best traits turning him into the world's greatest hero and even when he's outmatched Steve Rogers just does not flinch he never fails to embody the best of what humanity and what America has to offer for the world so my road of trials was my serum it brought out my best traits because I was willing to work through it because of my ordeal I found courage, conviction, the value of sacrifice, great. But I also found humility, compassion, and the value of listening so as to understand others. And that was key for me to really remember is that I set out on this journey to become the ideal or as close to it as I possibly could. And Lauren reminded me that I had stopped working towards it. Now I needed to get back on track and get back to coming home. You could communicate your ideas better to people. You can incept them better if you don't tell them why you're doing it. If I was to rewrite this completely differently, if I wanted to be more, oh, I'm gonna drive this point home, I could rewrite this thing this way. But I'm being this brutally upfront and honest with you all because I think that's more important than trying to use clever wordplay to manipulate you into what I think you should do with your life. I'm not gonna tell you to do that. I'm gonna give you the raw truth of what I did wrong and what I did to try to correct it and what I'm doing to try to correct it. At the end of Lord of the Rings, when the hobbits went back, minus Frodo, they knew that once they got back to the Shire, nothing would be as exciting. The battles they fought and the death they stared down and the mountains they climbed, it would just really set the difference between that adventure and their ordinary world. I think Samwise Gamgee realized that when he finally got up to approach the barmaid. He had stared at her longingly since the very beginning of the story, but he finally goes over and talks to her. And in that moment, he knows he's going to marry her, have an ordinary life. There's gonna be chores and tears and diaper changes and celebrations and squabbles and wedded bliss. He knew that his life would go from dull to jarring to finding these beautiful rapturous moments of sheer joy that could be beyond description. I feel like one thing that's also not really being talked about is the fact that you come back with a different perspective. You view things from a different lens. Your ordinary world, now it's constantly tingling with like these little wonderful sensations and adventures and treasures of their own. You've changed internally, right? So that ordinary world is different. Maybe you fear of going back to what was. In truth, you're going back to something new because you're new and you're looking at it in a different way. Maybe it's just recognizing that also you're fearing the monotony or the dullness mm. right like oh this was such a great adventure yeah but you're different now and that place is now going to be different now that you're coming back what was that argument ben shapiro used if you could go back and kill baby hitler that's a trope used in other arguments which we're not getting into obviously the counter argument to that is to to change the thought experiment and say well what about if you can go back in time and nurture baby hitler so that he doesn't grow up to be a mass murdering psychopath 
if you could do that to Stalin, if you could do that with Mao, if you could be that influencing force to find the magic in reality that all kids can and nurture the, the best parts of humanity. That's what Hero was designed to do, is to be that example, to say these are the best things we can do. As you said, it's more about searching out the new adventure in those potentially dull moments instead of just going through that drudgery of just the daily grind of living. Make living be such a better, grander experience that it really is. Bring it to the full, bring it to the fore, and make it so that the people that you left behind can start to understand the same thing that you learned when you went into the special world and returned. And that's the greatest gift for you to be able to share that, to be that ideal for them. You're a part of this collective, you're a part of this group, and this group now has something to aspire to. That in itself is the treasure is that new experience. All the joy you get out of the pain that you would go through. That's why I'm being as, as honest and raw about this. I had to come to figure this stuff out. Just as Sam did when he went across the pub. Realize he's gonna search out all those little moments together with this person. It's gonna make life so much richer, so much more enjoyable. And Gary Vee talks about this a lot. He always talks about playing the long game. Money's a little tight for me right now. And it was funny, I just went to the spa today to pick up my W-2. What I swear to the gods will be my last W-2. And I thought about it, it's like, you know, if I had wanted to just make money, I could really hustle being a massage therapist. I could hustle being a Pilates instructor, making 25, 35, and some cases $50 an hour but chasing those dollar bills and trying to you know have a little more comfortable life now isn't going to necessarily help me for the future and it's not going to enrich my life because this is the stuff I want to do this, this gives, gives me purpose mean. and at the end of the day and I don't no have to fight with anyone gonna beat that. no dollar amount is going to supplant that sense of purpose and meaning what are you doing you're serving that's what it comes down to even today I was reading this incredible article about mm -hmm. time most people would rather make less but have more time yeah you know obviously there, there are situations where, yeah, no money is tight. Ooh, That's reality. I'm not denying that reality. There's a Goldilocks zone. You have enough to satisfy your needs, but now you can choose to reprioritize how you choose to spend your money. So maybe you're spending it in a way that actually saves you time. Well, like I said before, I'm in a good position. After my divorce, I moved back home. My parents are supportive and understanding. My overhead isn't as high as it could be. So yeah, I'm able to reprioritize. And the woman who runs a Pilates studio I work at, she's hooked me up with a really great accountant. All the little things I'll learn as a business owner that I wouldn't know otherwise, I've outsourced to somebody else to teach me. Even reading or doing videos, like I'll get lost in all that stuff. Look, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. All I know is I had stopped myself from returning because I was getting comfortable in just being in one zone in one state and really as I've said I, I think I was talking about one of my massage clients and talking about bridging the gap between you know people's beliefs and saying that oh you know I'm, I'm far right but let me tell you you know you could find allies over here that was great and all but really I, I tried to assess myself as Lauren pointed out while we were talking she goes you're not far right I'm like yeah I'm probably not I think the center just moved <laughs> but you know what's funny like for me this refusal the return is simply a refusal of the call to adventure because that return is just another adventure filled with its own new cycles Tom's covering the depth on this episode tonight <laughs> That's exactly it. It's searching out those little moments. And by the way, kids will help you do that. Like playing with my daughter. She just loves cuddling up for even if it's just like 10 minutes. Taking that <laughs> those little bits of time and really just living into them. And that's something, as I said, things have been a little stalled on my end right now the last few weeks. At first I was a nervous wreck, Tom. Was, was I a nervous wreck? You were a nervous wreck. <laughs> <laughs> things on the podcast got kind of stalled. Fines have been canceled left and right. Like I was stuck. It was the gods saying, you will calm down for a second. It was because I was not comfortable not doing anything. I was distracting myself. Same thing as I was distracting myself in the combat and the fighting and getting blocked and calling it a, a personal reward. Well, I don't have to talk to that asshole anymore. That doesn't help me because those were my friends for a reason. And those are the people that I wanted to connect with the most, to teach the most. It's like, look, I'm not saying go out and buy a MAGA hat. I'm saying embrace some of these ideologies that I've learned about over here in this special world, in this other side, and realize, you know, put, put the work in, put the time in, invest in yourself. Instead of buying another game and every single downloadable extension, why don't you put that money in a development course? Instead of sitting at home watching Netflix, if you love food, if you're passionate about cooking, go take a cooking class. Go do a wine and paint night. Get out more. Be out more. Be with people more. This is what's important. If I didn't maintain and ask Lauren how many times she wanted to drop my fat ass, I can show you the text how many times she says we're done. She, to her credit, has seen the potential in what I can do mm -hmm. once I get out of my own way. 
And this is why I'm telling you guys this story. This is why I'm sharing this, is because usually the things that get in your way are the same size and shape as you. That's the hardest <laughs> obstacle to overcome. Sometimes there are threshold guardians at that return point. Usually it's you. I encourage all of you to see what you're resisting right now or what's causing you discomfort because that's exactly where you need to be. And that's what exactly where you need to go. We don't pursue certain things because we have these uh, slight fears. It's A, becoming aware of them, and B, making a choice to do something about them. Maybe you have a fear of public speaking, mm -hmm. so maybe taking a class, maybe a Toastmaster here and there, or whatever the case is, just getting comfortable with that discomfort. Give yourself some time, like we're, we live in such a noisy, hectic world, but give yourself some time, some quiet, some mm -hmm. solitude to really do some deep thinking about these things. Where are you uncomfortable? Or where are you too comfortable? That's uh, a good one. Where are you too comfortable? These are signposts that are going to be steering you in the direction you now need to be taking. It's so counterintuitive, and Dr. Peterson has said that a number of times. He's like, it's so counterintuitive to go towards pain because that's where you do the most growing. Campbell said the same thing. That's what these stories are for. These stories are there to tell you to go against your intuition. That's what the whole hero's journey is about. Fight your, your natural tendencies to go just your own way. I mean, yeah, we talk about, you know, walking your path and living your truth and follow your bliss and all that bullshit. But at a certain level, there's also this denial of the self. Apotheosis, that's where you become the hero, where you become the symbol, you throw yourself down, you, you give of yourself for the quote, greater good. But it's also mutual good. And this is where I think people go wrong. Bring this back to collectivism, where people go wrong with the collective is that when it's all for the greater good, you know, when you're talking about, you know, communism or socialism or fascism or any of these isms, they always talk about the greater good and sacrifice for the state and sacrifice for the community. If it doesn't benefit you and the community, it's not good. It's another Petersonism. <laughs> it's not good, man. That's where you really want to aim for. As Tom says, that Goldilocks zone where what you're doing is difficult, but it's helping you grow. It's good for you. And it's good for the community. It's good for your collective. It's good for your tribe. I learned all these things and now I have to bring it back. How exactly to bring that back? That's a whole other episode. It's a, it's a whole other series of episodes. It's my life now. Even when I'm just scrolling on social media, even Instagram, there are things I won't, I might find funny and enjoyable and that natural impulse to just double tap, I stop myself because I say this is gonna show might show up on someone else's feed who would be repulsed by it. I honestly could get better at doing that. That's my sacrifice in a, in a small sense, is changing my habit. Let's talk about you know how you change those habits, doing the things that are uncomfortable or sometimes not doing the things that are comfortable. It's fighting that impulse to double tap on everything that I find hilarious or I think needs to be supported, but that is going to repulse other people that at some point, I want to turn around and say, listen, talking about hard work, stoicism, rugged individualism is not a fairy tale of the 1%. It's the reality of the world. We've just forgotten about that. And then we took the concept and polarized it and threw it over here. And let's walk this back a little bit. We want to talk about solutions, as, as Dr. Peterson has said many times. If the opposite sides don't talk, then all you can do is fight. Those are your only options is to have a war. Boy, I love me a good war. I can't do that if I want to give of myself to right. the greater good. So the lesson here is move towards pain. A couple weeks ago, I did a three day water fast. Talk about moving towards pain. You'll never catch an Italian doing that. <laughs> Why do it? Because you grow from it. Aside from all the incredible like health benefits you get just from fasting alone, yeah, right? Like, you know, like cellular turn turnover, it's lowered inflammation, mm -hmm. and your brain's got more BDNF. Why I do it for me personally is to test my discipline, but also because it gives that body a chance, again, the silence, the mm -hmm. solitude, to, to do its own internal work, mm -hmm. right? You start noticing your thoughts so much more. You start realizing where there's certain impulses or certain mm -hmm. cravings or certain desires for distraction because you can't sit with it. So then you have to sit with it. I realized that I was just stretching myself way too thin, overly stimulated. I was taking on way too many things, saying yes to way too many things, and I was completely completely burning out. For weeks, I'd been feeling this huge drag on my energy. This, I realized in part, is because I'd done this to myself. I was also constantly medicating with things like coffee. Are you off coffee now? And so that was number two, right? Like I finally realized that I'm like, all right, so I'm gonna have to get this up too. Let my adrenals reset and I gotta like let the body just kind of regain its own homeostasis and rebalance. And so that was one of the most terrifying things for me because 
of how dependent I was on. I mean, it's nowhere near my worst. A few years back, I kid you not, I, I would drink a whole pot by myself. I mean, that's like 12 cups. That's because I was always a perfectionist. I was always type A. I always had to do and be the best because I always sought external validation. And that was a lesson I definitely always kind of come back to and it's a lesson I continually have to sort of almost relearn is because I do fall into these bad habits and routines because I'm trying to excel, but I'm excelling sometimes, oftentimes, for the wrong reasons. Not because it's something that I find within myself. Y'all might notice that Tom and I have a very differing delivery. And I find that funny because maybe at a certain point when I was younger, I needed a lot of external validation and I have no sense of time. So at some point I really don't. I should say this, once I became more me, the less external validation I needed because I'm very self-motivated. And I find the contrast between us different. We're both doers, we're both conscientious, conservative dudes, but internally, and thank you for your vulnerability to everyone out there, you know, you said like, I'm motivated by an, you know, external validation. Me, I'm motivated by a ticking fucking bomb in my head or some <laughs> shit. Like, I don't know how to describe what it is when you're just internally, personally motivated to just want to take over the fucking world. I, I find the contrast between us in that the result is the same, but the reason is so different. And this is something I think I just want to like, as a side note, kind of stress to everybody is as to why we say get quiet, get still, meditate, go to the woods, go to the ocean, is to figure this stuff out. Yeah. What are you motivated by? What really drives you? Why did you answer that call to adventure? Why aren't you answering that call? All these whys and wherefores you need to really dig into and the only way you will find it, as Tom said, is in that quiet. Having this awareness, now I kind of filter everything I do through that. It gives me so much more clarity because I know that that was always such a driving force. Now when I make decisions or take things on, uh, whatever I do, I try to filter it through that. Like, why am I doing this? Should I be doing this? Is this a result of that? And then I start to frame things better for myself. And then it gives me so much better clarity around the decisions I should and shouldn't be making. Dropping coffee was a perfect example of that because I, I, I did that for me, for my own self. I'll say this, I'm laughing so uncomfortably when he talks about it because I know I'll have to do it. I know I have to get there at some point. I know I have to get off that shit. FYI, yeah. people with ADD, ADHD have a lot of slow brainwaves in their prefrontal. So stimulants actually ramp that activity up, which is why it calms me down. It can come in the form of coffee, that can come in the form of video games, anything that gets yeah. you going. That's what I find so interesting. It's like the next, this stage and the next two, these three stages are kind of all considered optional in the hero's journey. They don't have to be in the story. You, know, you can have one, you can have two, you can have none. Um, we're talking about refusal of the turn, magic flight and rescue from without. Those are the next two. And there's really a lot more depth in them and things that you need to think about. Uh, so I want everybody to just kind of put this all together for yourself that there's a lot more here. So don't ever really brush any of these stages off. And we want you to consider them thoughtfully and carefully to go into that silence whenever you can. Trust me, it works. It won't be easy, but oh. that's where the growth happens. All right, so that was a last shout out to the Five Center. Another shout out to James Moreno. One more time, uh, if you go to the YouTube channel description for this video podcast, you go to the blog, you can find links to anything that we've mentioned today, uh, DVDs, books, everything is down there, so please, Go check those out. If you make a purchase, I'm not telling you to make a purchase, but if you do, we would greatly appreciate that little slice off the top. And with that, guys, this is Matt. Going to the dark and to the pain. Tom. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.